It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and John Daigle. Feed me now! I'm starving! On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby. It is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast, the show that's so nice we do it twice. We are presented by DraftKings. I'm Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years. Now I'm a broadcaster. Only got one game this weekend, no doubleheader. And I'll be Monday night in the booth for Jags and Bills. So if you're driving around, I'll be on a bunch of different radio stations via Westwood One Radio. Very much looking forward to that. You can check me out on social at Ross Tucker NFL. Check us out at Ross Tucker Pod. More and more people always checking us out on the video side of things, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. The star of the show is John Daigle from EstablishTheRun.com. Use that code FEAST to get a discount over at EstablishTheRun.com. And check John out on social as well. So you know everything he's up to, and he also has some really poignant tweets at times, at not J Daigle. Let's start, John, episode two here with the Panthers at the Raiders, and the Panthers are making a quarterback change already, John. What does it mean for them from a fantasy perspective? And I don't know how you feel about the quarterback change, but I actually think it's hats off to Dave Canales. It's a double-edged sword because, yes, the Panthers and Canales should have developed Bryce Young further, got him some more talent this offseason. But at the same time, it's only week two. You're still live. You have to instill some kind of hope and faith into your offense and team altogether. You can't lose them already in your first year as head coach. So I like making the move immediately to a veteran quarterback in Andy Dalton. And I think the fantasy world is actually excited because it's only a one-game sample. But at least we saw in Andy Dalton's lone game last year, I don't put too much stock into the 300-yard performance because he did throw 50-plus passes. Pretty easy to get there as a even a league average quarterback if you throw 50 plus passes but the fact that on his throws 20 yards deep he completed four of six for 20 yards per attempt he was incredible when asked to take shots and that's kind of the point with this game is that I think it goes over the total I actually love it for a sneaky shootout in week two if you're looking to bet the over on DraftKings because I think Andy Dalton is relevant enough to be a QB2 for Superflex leagues and get both Deontay Johnson and Adam Thielen back in our flex valued levels uh not to mention on establish the run if you do use that promo code feast i do fab suggestions in free agency fantasy football for quarterbacks as well for super flex leagues i mentioned picking up dalton for eight to eleven bucks out of a hundred dollars budget so i like the panthers passing game here a lot and on the other side of the ball What I really like is the Raiders to respond because this Panthers defense, a lot like how we talked about in the last episode, how the Eagles defense carried over from last year and is still struggling on every aspect of the ball, the Panthers defense with so many injuries can't stop anyone. Everyone's looking to Zamir White in this game, and I do think he has a higher floor on early downs because the Panthers' run defense is one of the absolute worst in the league, but... I don't want to hide the fact that the Panthers' pass defense has also been atrocious so far. Uh, And yes, they've had some, a little bit of tougher matchups, especially with the Saints in Week 1, but I think the Raiders' passing game is the one to really look out here for some prop overs. And that includes one of my favorite picks of the week in Brock Bowers. So far... Brock Bowers has been targeted on 29% of his routes through two games, and the Raiders weren't lying in how they wanted to use him out the gates. He's registered snaps in line from the slot, out wide, and even as a running back. Although his box score in Week 2 looks great, nine catches, nearly 100 yards. It would have looked even better if he wasn't tackled at the one-yard line. He was right there, and he got stuffed for a touchdown. So Brock Bowers, not only a top-five tight end the rest of the season, but someone I'm very high on the props market here in Week 2. Love it. That is actually going to be John's value pick presented by DraftKings. DraftKings, the crown is yours. My value pick, by the way, is Labatt Blue Light. Because it's delicious, it's not that expensive, it's yummy. Drink some Labatt Blue Lights with your friends and live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Okay, John, what about 
in the next matchup, Dolphins Seahawks. Dolphins obviously another team making a quarterback change, although this one was not their idea. And speaking of Superflex leagues, I'm going to take it one step further, which is what we try to do to establish the run using the promo code FEAST. We try to project, and I will tell you, we've seen four games already. It was 2022. Devon A. Chan was not on the team, but we've seen Skyler Thompson play in the regular season, in the playoffs, in the preseason, and unfortunately, he's just not the guy to get it done. He's going to start this game, but I think the deeper league look is Tyler Huntley, who did keep the Ravens relevant, has played in a playoff game, and looked good, by the way, whenever he did so. I believe it was against the Bengals in 2021-2022. They picked up Huntley off waivers to be the backup immediately. I think that's the player I look to in super flex leagues, assuming he'll probably take over for Skylar Thompson in a couple weeks. But in the short term, obviously a matchup I respect against Mike McDonald's defense and one I'm not really trying to be high on much of anyone. I'm only trusting from Thompson in this game, Tyreek Hill, who we at least saw in 2022 in those four starts with Thompson, was targeted on 30% of his routes, and Devon A. Chan, who as we even saw on Thursday, I do wish they would have taken out of the game in the fourth quarter when it was out of hand, but Mike McDonald, Mike uh, Mike McDaniel just kept giving him all the touches he ever wanted. Not to mention Jeff Wilson suffered an injury on Thursday, and we're still waiting for injury reports on that. So maybe it's just all Devon Achan. And we do know Thompson in 2022 targeted his running backs at a league-high 23% rate. So I still love Achan in this game, just even if the offensive structure crumbles with Thompson under center. On the other side of the ball, Ryan Grubb, what he's done with his passing attack, getting it right immediately in Week 2 against the Patriots is something you have to respect. And so far, the Seahawks have not only passed the ball at the 8th highest rate in the league, but they used three wide sets. Lockett, DK Metcalf, Jackson Smith, and Jigba at the 8th highest rate in the league as well. So, although the passing offense will still be the main focus here... Kenneth Walker, if we think the Dolphins are going to struggle on offense, that's the RB2. That's the sneaky play. Because although he didn't look too good last week in a very tough matchup against the Patriots, this is a Miami defense who has still given it up on the ground. Most recently, James Cook with all those touchdowns on Thursday night. And Walker handled every single running back touch for the Seahawks, despite his inefficiency in Week 2. So assuming Kenneth Walker is still out, Zach Charbonnet is who I'm talking about. Zach Charbonnet is the player I want to start as a sneaky top 24 player. This next matchup is fascinating because the Lions haven't really looked like the Lions offensively to this no. point in the year. Meanwhile, the Cardinals, that was impressive. Marvin Harrison Jr., what a difference a week makes, John. And the Cardinals just have everything going for them right now. Yes, they struggled, the passing game in particular. Marvin Harrison Jr. as well in Week 1 against that stingy Bills pass defense. But right now, the Cardinals offense even opened things up last week. A lot more 13 personnel in order to drag defenders closer to the line of scrimmage. Get Marvin Harrison Jr. a one-on-one coverage. And he obviously delivered a couple back shoulder throws that the timing just wasn't right in week one. A deep 60-yard touchdown, toe tapping in the back of the end zone. Um, broke free whenever Kyler Murray broke the pocket. The rapport just came back to earth within seven days. So happy to see Marvin Harrison Jr. We are obviously having all the confidence in the world in both him and Trey McBride in this matchup. Since the Lions defense, a lot like some of these other defenses we talked about, Despite adding some respected defenders in their secondary this offseason, it's really just been copy and paste from last year and struggling to contain the pass. Uh, still top five in fantasy points allowed to opposing wide receivers. So another great matchup for Kyler Murray and Marvin Harrison Jr. Much tougher for James Conner, who you're still starting as a touch base top 24 player, but the fact that the Lions have still been extremely stingy on the ground, even going back to last week and limiting Rashad White to less than 30 rushing yards, uh, something we had to respect at least, even with Drew Petzing scheming those rushing plays for Arizona. For the Lions, and you mentioned, I'm torn because it's only two games. It's a small sample. But the matchups, at least on paper, should have been dunks, not layups, dunks for Jared Goff against the Rams and the Bucks. 
And so far, Jared Goff has been extremely poor, even from a clean pocket. Just a 63% completion rate, 27th in the league. And so, although you've seen Amon Ross St. Brown get back involved in Week 2, Jameson Williams is stealing targets, basically, from Sam Laporta. Sam Laporta now has to be viewed closer to a low-end tight end one the rest of the season. It's really just comes down to Jared Goff and his efficiency, and that's been bad so far. So, I question Jared Goff's ceiling in this matchup, but given that it's still one that we don't fear the Arizona defense, I am looking for at least one more week to go back to him in Superflex leagues and continuing to start all these guys, St. Brown, Williams, and Laporta. Again, one more game. Um, And then Arizona offensively? Yeah, having faith in Marvin Harrison Jr. in that game again, but still, just like last year, as I mentioned earlier, since the Lions' front seven is still so ferocious against the run, it's almost as if they should be worse against the run to force teams to pass less just because they struggle <laughs> so much to cover wide receivers. But it's a much tougher matchup for James Conner, not someone I want to use in DraftKings DFS this week just because I don't think he has the ceiling of this game. But for your managed leagues, still low-end RB2, he'll get the touches to get there. All right, let's talk another juicy matchup, John. It's the Ravens and the Cowboys. I know what the Ravens want to do. We see it every week. They want to utilize Derrick Henry up the gut. But this interior between Daniel Fa'alele and Andrew Voorhees has unfortunately been one of the worst in the league so far. And that's why every time you look up and watch this Ravens offense, Derrick Henry's either getting stuffed at the line of scrimmage or Lamar Jackson's being asked to make a miracle back foot play uh, deep through the air and so far that's helped out Zay Flowers like Zay Flowers has moved up our rest of season top 150 rankings that established the run because he has a 25% and 35% target share in the first two games Isaiah likely not surprisingly came back to earth in week two um, the Ravens ran less 12 personnel a lot because they were having to add more blockers to get Max Crosby off Lamar Jackson's back in that game but still in this matchup we expect to be an explosive one against the Cowboys offense I do think it's another game to trust likely and go back to him as a low end tight end one the interesting matchup for this though is the Cowboys passing game against the Ravens defense. Because so far, without Mike McDonald, and due to the offseason changes they experienced, this Ravens defense has not been able to cover the pass whatsoever. No secondary has allowed more 15-yard gains through the air than Baltimore. And that's including Gardner Minshew's and the passing offense in Vegas, who had six-plus explosive plays through the air just last week. And like, what do you think happens when Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb come to town? So I like Dak a lot more than perceived in this matchup as a ceiling option. Could maybe even finish as the overall QB1 in fantasy in this game. And then the interesting player to monitor is Jalen Tolbert because he did walk away last week. Some of it was in garbage time, but he was still hammered with a team high, nine targets, Brandon Cooks was the loser in that matchup behind wide receiver CeeDee Lamb. So Tolbert may be a sneak, a sleeper for 12-team, 14-team deep leagues that we need to be ahead of, especially if we think the Ravens are going to struggle again against this passing attack. Wow. Did not think we'd be talking about Jalen Tolbert, but I knew we'd be talking about grabbing a bottle of Smirnoff at your local retailer and heading to Smirnoff.com to find recipes of delicious cocktails perfect for game day. Please drink responsibly. Smirnoff number 21 vodka, distilled from grain, 40% alcohol by volume. The Smirnoff Company, New York, New York. Please do not share with anyone under legal drinking age. It's award-winning vodka started in 1864. All right, there's a lot to talk about here, John, with the injuries in the Niners and the Rams matchup. And let's start with the Rams because it's something we discussed last week, how I was personally worried about the trajectory of the Rams with so many injuries and more just happened on Sunday. So much so that, I don't know if you noticed, Ross, but we we don't even know what Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua's return will be because the Rams have already used up all of their short-term injured reserve list spots. You know, every team only has four, and the Rams have used them up. So we don't even know if Cooper Cup like can return this season, if he's ready to return, since they have only said so far he's going to be out, quote, an extended period. We just don't know the timeline. Not to mention that we still have three starting offensive linemen missing for the Rams. Jonah Jackson now out, or the safety, John Jackson also out, 
and their secondary as well. Uh, in the fourth quarter against the Cardinals, the Rams were down to five reserve cornerbacks. All five were rookies, and four of them were undrafted. Those are the bodies that the Rams have to use right now. They're so banged up. And so I still think they're just on a trajectory that leads to their demise. Like, I have so much respect in the world for Sean McFay and what he's done there, even as a play caller in the short term. But asking Matthew Stafford, with no pass pro, to elevate Demarcus Robinson and Tyler Johnson, it's just too much, honestly, for anyone. Let alone in this matchup, Matthew Stafford hasn't scored over 18 fantasy points in all five career games against Kyle Shanahan. Shanahan has owned McFay whenever they've played against one another so far. So I love the 49ers to just come out with a dominant win here, and we know what's going to happen. They're going to lean on Jordan Mason, who even in week two outsnapped backup Isaac Garendo 57 to 1. Uh, Jordan Mason became just the third running back since week two last year to rush for over 60 yards against Brian Flores. He's clearly shown he is a very explosive player, and I think he's going to get all the work he could possibly handle here. Not only that, but Debo Samuel's absence. Although I don't expect it to affect this game if, you know, my projection and score outcome is correct. Who knows? There's lots of range of outcomes. But Juwan Jennings is still the player to pick up in 14-team leagues, especially without Christian McCaffrey, because those targets shallow over the middle of the field have to go somewhere. And I'm thinking most likely it's their slot receiver and Juwan Jennings, who is very familiar with the playbook, has had some splash performance as well, played three games without Debo Samuel last year and recorded a 14% target share. So Juwan Jennings is the pickup there for the next two weeks in place of Debo. Let's talk Sunday night, John. Chiefs, Falcons, Falcons offense, Bijan and Kirk Cousins looked much better against the Eagles than they did against the Steelers. Much better, and Kirk Cousins still not quite planting on that back foot but still much healthier and a much better game plan with at least a little more play action a little less pistol just opening it up a hair more we've seen Darnell Moody and Ray Ray McLeod still run a route on every drop back for the Falcons including on Monday night and they got there I still wonder how much of Darnell Mooney's production was because it came against that Eagle secondary as he just ran by everyone for his 42-yard touchdown, broke a tackle, and got there. Um, and Ray Ray McLeod, like the sustainability of his opportunity in this offense, so much so that it hasn't been great for Kyle Pitt so far. A touchdown in week one, and that's really why he's the tight end seven in fantasy right now. But... We do know that that particular area of the field, over the middle, the tight ends, is where the Chiefs so far have really struggled. Isaiah likely had that career performance in week one, and Mike Jasicki last week, a team-high nine targets, getting there with a touchdown as well. So I like Kyle Pitts here to outperform Darnell Moody and to really maybe even lead the Falcons in receiving yards over Drake London. I think the matchup is just great for him to bounce back. On the other side of the ball, the Chiefs offense without Isaiah Pacheco is the talk of fantasy, because everyone wants to know who to pick up. And I believe it leads to Carson Steele. Kareem Hunt, the short term, is going to be on practice squad for this game. And I don't mind sprinkling on Kareem Hunt, if only because at least through two weeks, the Chiefs have showed that Samaji Pirine is really only a pass catching back. They haven't given him a single carry so far. Kareem Hunt's familiar with Andy Reid's playbook, and we know what he can do in that offense if and when he's called up. But they showed in week two behind the scenes they trust and love Carson Steele. I don't think people noticed, but Carson Steele had five carries, including a goal line carry, in the first half when Isaiah Pacheco was still healthy. And then, even though he fumbled in the third quarter, when the game, when it, when it was pushed to shove, and the game, like, someone had to make plays, they gave Carson still two carries to put Harrison Bucker in position to win the game with a 51-yard field goal. That's who they want to use, at least on early downs and inside the 10-yard line. So I think Carson Steele is the highest upside pickup among that backfield for everyone trying to go to their waiver wires and find Pacheco's replacement. Two games on Monday night. John, I'll be calling the first one on the radio, Westwood 1, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Jags at the Bills, and then Commanders at the Bengals. But let's start with the Jags, who are struggling offensively against the Bills. It's been 
very bad for the Jaguars. And it's not just these two games. Trevor Lawrence has been a top 10 quarterback in fantasy for six consecutive performances going back to last year. Um, and unfortunately, although Doug Peterson is known as being an offensive guru, I don't know if he's really helping anyone out right now on that offense and making life easier for Trevor Lawrence. Brian Thomas has been the highlight, so much so that establish the run Using the promo code FEAST, of course, you can see that Brian Thomas is our favorite Jaguars receiver to roster for the rest of the season. And so far, because he's been involved, he's really boxed out Christian Kirk. Everyone is very frustrated and wants to drop Christian Kirk, who has just two catches for 29 yards on seven targets through two games. But given how efficient this Bills offense is, at least in the short term, I don't think the Jaguars have any choice but to go to more 11 personnel, three wide sets in this one, which obviously gets Christian Kirk involved more from the slot. So I like waiting it out in Christian Kirk, not even saying start him. I think he's outside the top 36 wide receivers this week, but I like waiting it out, thinking he's going to be on the field more and thus getting more opportunity and then selling him ahead of week four. And with Tank Bigsby quietly getting injured in the first quarter, we really didn't get any more usage updates on how they like to treat Travis Etienne and Bigsby together. But if Bigsby remains out on Monday night, you can be assured that Etienne's going to get every touch for that backfield, no matter how inefficient he may be. So Travis Etienne, a usage-based RB1 as well, assuming Bigsby stays out. On the other side of the ball, the Bills are going to get man coverage. That's what the Jaguars have run at a league-high rate so far, and that that's just how they want to play, which I'm guessing is going to be much better for Josh Allen than Miami's defense showed because, as we know, man coverage historically has led to more running back carries because cornerbacks are then dragging themselves away from the line of scrimmage, and that's what Josh Allen's going to do best. Uh, not to mention that we can probably get mismatches out of the backfield in the flats with James Cook's continued use as well, as they've shown... They just don't trust anyone yet behind Cook. Ray Davis, Ty Johnson, really an afterthought with no value in fantasy right now, which has led to Cook not only being a successful player, but unlike last year, James Cook has had multiple carries inside the five-yard line this year as well. Uh, like They are trying to get him more involved in that so important territory for fantasy. So it's clear that this game is Josh Allen, James Cook, and Khalil Shakur to a lesser extent, who in man coverage is still the much more explosive player. Keon Coleman's out there. Everyone wants Coleman to be a thing immediately, but obviously he's a struggling rookie in his first couple of games. And as someone who doesn't really separate, who used even in college at Michigan State, Florida State, used his big body to catch touchdowns that way, I think it's just going to take a little more development for Keon Coleman to be relevant in fantasy. Last but not least, the commanders at the Bengals, John. I discussed with you last week how I thought Daniel Jones was a sneaky top 12 quarterback. That was a bold call because of how poor this commander's defense has historically been. And now we've seen in 16 of their last 18 games, they've allowed a top 12 quarterback going back to last year. This is a get right spot for Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, and the Bengals passing game if there ever were one. Not only that, but even you mentioned in the last episode how Devin Singletary looked so explosive getting all the touches for that Giants backfield. That's basically what the Bengals backfield has become because as much as all of us want Chase Brown to be a sleeper there for what he showed with an explosive screen last year when he got to step in for Joe Mixon, so far this has only been Zach Mawson's backfield with 75% of the snaps and essentially all the touches, over 70% of the team's backfield touches. So I like Zach Moss as a fringe RB2 here, someone I'm definitely trying to jam in all my lineups as a flex play, and I like buying low on Kyler Murray against this abysmal Washington, or I'm sorry, against I like buying low on Jamar Chase against this abysmal Washington secondary because, yes, the production hasn't been there for Jamar Chase, but we also know, like, last week, a 14.5% target share. We know Jamar Chase is going to get a lot more than that once he gets those reps under his belt and knocks the rust off from being absent all offseason. So Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Zach Moss, the players I'm looking at. The sneaky play on the other side of the ball for me, because you know you're starting Jaden Daniels having all that rushing floor, is Brian Robinson. 
Because not only is Brian Robinson commanding all the carries and touches in this backfield, the Bengals quietly lost both B.J. Hill and Sheldon Rankins up the gut in Week 2. They had to go to the free agency wire and signed a defensive tackle off the streets. I think that means it's going to be a big day for Brian Robinson as one of the best sleeper running backs in the league. Ooh, I like that note because I didn't notice that about those D tackles. And yes, they signed Lawrence Guy. Good call, John. That's it. Get him on social at not Jay Dago. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL. We are at Ross Tucker pod. I am stuffed. We're done. Thanks for tuning in to fantasy feast. Make sure to also check out the Ross Tucker football podcast, Even Money, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform.